the week three of the statistics course organized by West Bengal ERY chapter. And uh, today, to conduct our session, I would like to invite Dr. Shuranjan Moitro. Uh, Dr. Shuranjan, are you there? Dr. Shuranjan, are you there? Dr. Shuranjan? Okay, fine. Uh, we can start. Uh, I think he's. Uh, oh, you can start. Hello. Okay, fine. Oh, uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, uh, I would like to invite uh, first our chairpersons, uh, Professor Dr. Alok Ghosdostidar and uh, Dr. Devabroto Mitra. Sir, are you, uh, Dr. Devabroto Mitra, sir, are you there? Uh, I think he's not joined yet. Okay, we can start. Alok sir with us. Alok sir, please uh, start okay. with the... Okay, uh, yeah. Mustaf, you can yeah. uh, start the program right from the right in time because today's okay. program is very much important topic. Dr. Anish Banerjee yeah. is there. He's the right person to conduct about the how to conduct the uh, sample size, I think. Concept of the null hypothesis yeah. and how to calculate the sample size. That is the most important thing, I think. I think in the statistics, in biostatistics, in for the beginners, and beside before that, Dr. Shumon Mollik is there to con uh, uh, conduct the question answer session as well as the rectification of the previous day's class. So I would request uh, Dr. Shumon Mollik, please uh, start his session. His session is meant for uh, 6:30 to 6:45, and within that stipulated time, Dr. Mollik may. Uh, conduct his question answer as well as the any queries of the previous days. Dr. Shuman Mullik, please. Thank you, all of the. So, uh, last, so last week actually we uh, discussed about the study design and epidemiological study, randomized control studies, and uh, we had few questions uh, last week. Vitan asked uh, whether. Odds ratio less than one, meaning negative prediction of outcome. Uh, so, uh, yes, uh, odds ratio if it is less than one, which means it's a negative association, which means suppose uh, uh, someone is using something or if something is protective for a disease, in that case, you will get a odds ratio less than one. And uh, Shatadru asked, uh, how promptly the sponsor or uh, investigator should report the SAE and to whom in India. So basically for standard, for uh, serious adver adverse reaction, you need to report within 24 hours. And if it is a clinical trial, you should inform uh, your sponsor, your ethics committee, and uh, as well as uh, uh, drug controller. Rupak uh, asked uh, whether it is ethical, whether ethical clearance is required for observational study like cohort study. Uh, yes, ethical clearance is required even for observational studies, uh, especially for prospective studies. Retrospective data, uh, even uh, though it is retrospective data, even for that ethical clearance is necessary but in few cases like retrospective audit or clinical audit in those cases actually expedite review can be done by uh, by ethics committee chairman himself or herself where uh, ethics committee chairman along with member secretary can uh, give the clearance of the study without further discussing the study in the ethics committee meeting and Bitan uh, asked uh, for observational studies, is sample size important? Yes, for any study, sample size is important. Why important that uh, Dr. Anish will tell you? Because in observational studies, suppose you want to see something, uh, uh, something if there is any association or if there is any positive factor. So to find out that factor, you need a, uh, minimum sample size 
to identify the factor so and to identify that factor correctly because if suppose you have taken three or five samples and you may get a, a result by chance so to reduce the chance factor to reduce the bias even for the observational studies it is important to have a correct sample size uh, uh gokula krishnan asked me about how to calculate and decide on confidence interval for a study so usually uh, confidence interval we uh, uh, measure along with the statistical test and usually we uh, define as a 95% confidence interval sometimes uh, in many studies they also uh, report 99% on confidence interval in that case actually spread will be more so this is uh, as per convention we follow the 95% rule as like in the p value you usually we follow the 95% rule and uh, and the other queries were from uh, the previous day mcq questions so first question was in the definition of epidemiology distribution refers to who when where and why so the answers will be who when and where because this is basically about distribution so when we'll ask about determinants then why will come so distribution will include who who are affected when they are uh, get affected and where actually the distribution of the disease the second question was uh, in the definition of epidemiology determinants generally includes agents sources causes risk factors that answers will be answer will be all of the above because all are determinants of any disease so agents causes sources risk factors and third uh, there was a question uh, it's uh, it's a situation rather a number of passenger in a cruise ship from china to kolkata have recently developed flu like illness compatible with sars cov 2 virus testing for coronavirus is not readily available in any nearby place and the test takes several days even where available assuming that you are epidemiologist called on the board of about the ship and investigate the possible outbreak your case definition should include at a minimum so it was a based answer was required so first option was clinical criteria plus specification of time place and person second was clinical features plus exposure c is suspect cases and d is nationally agreed standard case definition for disease reporting so answer will be a because for an for an epidemiologist uh, as there is no further no availability of any test so uh, it's based on critical uh, clinical criteria and you have to look at whether that is well correlated with time place and person that is the best answer and uh, nationally agreed standard case uh, definition is not an answer because in any uh, disease definition so until unless it is proved as uh, sars cov 2 it, it is not called as a sars cov 2 illness so that's why it it is incorrect statement and best statement is the first one and uh, the third question was a key feature of a cross sectional study are all except so it usually provides information on prevalence rather than incidence yes uh, that is true because uh, i uh, told you last time because we cannot uh, calculate the new cases when you are doing a snapshot study or survey or cross sectional study second it is limited to health exposure and behaviors rather than health outcome no it also look at the health outcome so uh, this is uh, actually false and it is more useful for descriptive epidemiology than it is for analytic yes most of the time descriptive epidemiology is done with the cross sectional studies for analytical studies it is better to do uh, case control studies or cohort studies 
and uh, it is synonymous with survey survey is a kind of cross sectional study yes and fifth there was more, there uh, were most uh, query from this fifth question that randomization is maintained in par protocol analysis intention to treat analysis as treated analysis permutated block analysis so you know that the par protocol analysis when uh, suppose we are uh, comparing uh, uh, chemo radiotherapy with radiotherapy suppose uh, if you feel during giving chemotherapy a patient is not fit for chemotherapy and you uh, actually omit chemotherapy for that patient so that patient will be uh, included um, uh, in as treated analysis for par protocol analysis that patient should be is excluded from the analysis and in intention to uh, treat analysis those patients actually will be considered as in the ctrtr now you may ask me where the randomization is broken because in intention to treat as we are keeping or analyzing the patient in the same arm as that patient was randomized so here the randomization is not broken but in other par protocol or as treated analysis we are actually breaking breaking the randomization because we are shifting the patients as treated and the problem is actually if you uh, uh, do your analysis based on as treated or par protocol actually you may introduce some biases because suppose uh, you are omitting those patients who actually received radiotherapy in chemo radiotherapy arm but you are not omitting those patients who are receiving radiotherapy in radiotherapy arm so there will be imbalance between the fit patient and unfit patients for chemotherapy in two arms so they actually by uh, this way you can introduce a bias and the balance between the two group will be Uh, lost and last question was all the general principles of ethics uh, all the are the general principles of ethics except principle of essentiality it is important because whether your study is essential to do second is principle of randomization actually ethics uh, doesn't uh, look at the randomization process or principle of randomization so this is incorrect principle of voluntariness it is important for ethical uh, clearance because every patient uh, should voluntarily uh, should participate in a study and last is principle of environmental protection it is also a uh, important aspect of any uh, ethical consideration so these were the doubts and these were the uh, questions that we had last time i think uh, this is enough if any further uh, query if you have you can directly call me or uh, mail me and now i think uh, it's over to uh, kosta uh, for next talk okay uh, uh, shuranjan are you there yes kosta i'm there i have uh, our chair persons are also there Oh, Thank you, Sumanda. And uh, now, uh, sir, Alok, sir, uh, over to you for the announcement of the next our session. Alok, sir. I think there is some technical problem. Alok, sir. Alok, sir, is there? Yeah, Alok, sir, it, is, it is showing that Alok sir is here, but uh, I think there is some technical problem. Okay, then. Am I audible right now? Yes, sir. Am I audible right now? Yes, sir. 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 Dr. Anish Banerjee uh, is present here. He will speak on this subject. I would request Dr. Banerjee to start his program right now. 
and so this is this is an important topic today thank you sir thank good evening sir and thank you sir thank you very much uh, thank you for the kind uh, introduction yes uh, so i will be uh, presenting hello hello yeah hello is it uh, am i audible hello yes 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 sir absolutely audible okay hello is the powerpoint screen uh, visible powerpoint is uh, yes yes visible carry on sir okay good evening everyone and uh, i will be discussing today something which is very important uh we had very uh, nice presentation two presentations earlier which uh, anupam ma'am gave a very good introduction to what, what is data how is data dispersed uh, dispersed how you measure central tendency and uh, dispersion then which was followed by sumanth's uh, excellent talk on what are the types of studies and how uh, how we uh, choose a particular study what are the ethical considerations what are the thing okay now this topic null hypothesis and sample size calculation uh, i will be dealing it in two parts part 1 is about i will tell something about what is hypothesis a basic concept normal curve and probability how null hypothesis can be explained by using a normal curve and what are the excuse me on is the huh? uh, uh, one point uh, please uh, there is a hide option right below your screen okay please i will hide that. that okay one sec no how to go back yeah so okay yes so thank you so and finally in that first part we will discuss about what is why do we need to test an hypothesis or what are the errors we make while testing an hypothesis the second part we we'll deal with the proper uh, topic that is how to calculate a sample size what is the relevance of you calculating a sample size how do we calculate sample size for a single sample study how do you size a sample size for a comparative study what are the consideration of sample size calculation for a randomized control trial and what are the modifications you need to make for sample size calculation now i must uh, confess that this is a topic where which needs a lot of conceptual understanding and mathematics so i have deliberately taken the mathematics part out and kept it to simple arithmetic only and focus more on the concept part okay so let's start with hypothesis from our uh, last lecture by dr suman we knew that while developing a study or while framing a study we go through a process and the process involves specific steps like problem identification that is which what problem you want to identify and see in your study this is followed by review of literature which tells you how much knowledge we know how much data is available how much evidence is available and what are the gaps in evidence and how our study can be catered to fill up this gap this is followed by defining or getting exactly what we want to find what is the specific objective what is what is the exact thing we want to find in our study and then the fourth but most important step it is the the step is the formulation of the research question that is what is the essential question you are trying to answer by your study this is followed by another statement of the research hypothesis now what is this hypothesis research hypothesis statement of research agree it is basically an answer to the research question that is it is a statement which gives the answer to the expected research outcomes it is a tentative guess we don't know from before the study starts we don't know what what is what results our study is going to put up but still we guess something and this guess is nothing but a hypothesis so we define a hypothesis we record with example record observation collect data and finally we see that 
test it with a statistical test and based on the results we reject or accept an hypothesis this type of inference drawing is called deductive method so we start with a basic assumption we take the we collect data and finally on the basis of data we either reject assumption or accept the assumption assumption there is another way of doing is inductive way but we generally in clinical research people follow a deductive way of inference so suppose this is a trial it is a very no, well known trial the bonner trial where radiotherapy was uh, supplemented with uh, cetuximab egf for uh, inhibitor and for squamous carcinoma of head and neck locally advanced and we and what what was the objective the objective was to compare whether radiotherapy alone uh, other whether radiotherapy plus restuximab was better than radiotherapy alone in having better local regional control so what was the research question the research question was does adding cetuximab to radiotherapy in treatment of local regional advanced squamous cell carcinoma improve local regional control and the hypothesis here would be adding cetuximab to radiotherapy in the treatment of local regional advanced squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck improve or does not improve local regional control by convention in statistics we always start with a negative connotation that is we assume that our treatment or our sample is no different our treatment has no effect such a connotation is called null hypothesis we'll deal with that now why do we need a hypothesis because it provides a tentative explanation it provides the investigator a clear statement that what we are going to see and it provides a direction for research which way we want to see we want to see improvement we want to see uh, harm we want to see whether there is any difference it also provides a framework for reporting conclusions of the study it provides as a uh, guideline to to rather uh, select the proper uh, statistical test and if it could be tested and shown to be uh, probably supported or not not supported on the basis of the test results we get scientifically so what is a null hypothesis a null hypothesis assumes that there is no difference or no effect why i'm saying that no difference and no effect because we i'm uh, at the same time defining two type of hypo uh, studies one the observational study and a intervention study in observational study we try to see, find out whether the sample represents the population or not or there's if the sample variable or attribute is different from the population variation or attribute in a comparative study which includes the observational trials the inter intervention trials observational studies and interventional trials we compare one group with another so there we say there is no difference in the case of null so it is generally represented by hgo and it represent the current state of knowledge that is before cetuximab was used we knew that radiotherapy uh, is good enough and adding anything would change the local regional control states that there is no difference and we find we conduct the study to find enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis it's like a straw man uh, logic you say something which is not true or you want to uh, you want to uh, make 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 that false you say the opposite and then find give evidence to say this is this is this, this or see suppose we think uh, we take this there is no evidence and then we give the evidence and say this this Null hypothesis is rejected. Okay, and it is represented by h zero is is to mu is equal to mu zero. Now, what is mu and mu zero? Mu is the mean of the sample or the test arm, and mu zero is the the mean of the population or the control arm, depending what type of study you are taking. Sorry. Now. since there is a null hypothesis there is also an alternative hypothesis alternative hypothesis on the uh, contrary as the name suggests it present the opposite idea of null hypothesis it represent that that there is some difference or there is some effect so it is represented as ha means mu is not equal to mu 0 again mu is the sample mean or sample attribute 
and mu zero is the population attribute or the attribute in the control arm or the standard arm. Alternative is hypothesis is also called as the research hypothesis because it's the thing it, it follows the objective and it is the thing that we want to test in a uh, research study. It's not moving. So here's an example. Suppose we know the patients undergoing conformal radiation with concurrent sensitivity experience power toxicity. We know IMRT is a good technique. It has it can has. Uh, Conformal avoidance, we can dose spend. We expect that, that it will reduce the bowel toxicity as compared to conformal radiotherapy. We want to test the effect of use of IMRT on bowel toxicity. So our null hypothesis will be IMRT has no effect as compared to conformal radiotherapy in reducing bowel health toxicity. And our alternative or research hypothesis will be excuse me. Sorry, I must has an effect. Some problem. Okay. Now, alternative hypothesis is slightly different from null hypothesis in the sense it is directional because it can set the direction on which we expect our findings. It can be, you know, state that is more than or less than. We can define from uh, the beginning of the study which way we want, we expect our finding to be that the new. Uh, new intervention will be more than effective or less than effective than the standard one or it can be non-directional that the new treatment or the sample mean is different from the standard one now what are the characteristics of a good hypothesis a good hypothesis should be simple specific and it should be stated in advance because it should not be so that after concluding the study, you get the evidence and then finally decide how then we, our hypothesis would be like this. No, no, it's, that way it should not be. Hypothesis has to be stated from behind, uh, from beforehand. It must have an explanatory power. It must state the expected relation between the variables, that is, the outcome variable and the intervention variable. It must be testable. And this it should be consistent with the existing body of knowledge. It should come not, it should not come from an abstract thing. It should be plausible, scientifically plausible, and logical. And it should be stated as simply and as concisely as possible, which includes the testing variable, the intervention, and the effect. Nothing more than that. We have start. We have completed what is a hypothesis or other types of hypothesis of the study. Into the next part, I will be telling something about, or rather, discussing something about called probability distribution. This is a concept we need to grasp before we can con uh, proceed further. Now, what is a probability distribution? Anupam has very clearly uh, explained in his uh, presentation that what is a frequency distribution. We know frequency distribution is a curve or a, a pictorial uh, form of representing the values of variant individual observations uh, against the number of times it, it, they come for a particular interval uh, data. A probability distribution is similar, but here it is not the original or actual values. It is the probability of a particular value falling in a particular interval for a continuous variable and also for a non-continuous or a or a dichotomous or a categorical variable. So, sorry, it is a function that describes the likelihood of obtaining possible values, all possible values that a random variable can assume. Now, what is a random variable? A random variable is a variable that is not dependent on other and that is independent to it can assume any 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 data value. In other words, the values of variability are very expressed on the underlying probability distribution. All uh, variables follow some or form of other form of probability distribution or they can also follow a random probability distribution which does not follow any particular predefined one. I will explain it slightly more. Suppose you have this y-axis and the x-axis. In the y-axis you plot the probability or the uh, probability function and in the x-axis you find the different values. So We'll get a curve. Now, 
this i will further explain suppose uh, you want to see what are the what are the what is the probability function or probability distribution of the age of mean age of um, all first year postgraduates in say a one medical college so you will uh, you will uh, so there will be a central value or the mean value or the median value where most of the most of the students uh, age will be there and there will be some outliers and if you if you take all the process suppose you have taken 200 uh, students the, the probability of then the total probability will be one and one observation will correspond to one by 200 of the uh, probability so the, as a number of probability uh, number of uh, observers in a particular interval say 26 and 27 between 26 and 27 years of age the number of uh, uh, number of uh, observation increase the probability also increase so this type of distribution where you can plot or we can uh, you can uh, pictorially depict the how where is the where is the central wheel as uh, where is the how where lies the central value and how the dispersion is is a probability probability distribution now the probability distribution can not only for continuous variables it can also occur for a discrete random variable now what is a discrete random variable a discrete discrete random variable is something which is categorical it could be and it also could be dichotomous now how could you plot a uh, probability of a dichotomous uh, variable it's like that suppose a couple wants to have child and they have decided to have four child four children now what is the probability that all four of them will be male vis-a-vis -vis, what is the probability of that two will be male and two will be female and two of the uh, there will be girl child and two will be the boy child and what is the probability of all being girl so if you plot them you will find that there are two extremes where all are girl and all are boy and in between we have several distribution whether boy and her so such a distribution, the probability of uh, um, where probability of uh, occurrence is plotted against the different values that all boys, all girls, two boys, one uh, two boys, one, uh, two girls, one boy, three girls, like that. So of the five possible combinations, the probability distribution gives you a, uh, the probability function gives a probability distribution. Now, of all the probability distributions we talk, there is something called normal distribution, which is which is generally followed by biological uh, variables and which is uh, specific for continuous random variable that that is a variable like blood pressure which follows an interval scale blood sugar body weight etc for a smaller sample of a continuous random variable it also follows uh, another distribution which is close to the normal distribution but not a normal distribution which is described as student's t distribution which is similar to normal distribution, but I won't be discussing this this binomial Poisson or uh, student distribution because this is beyond the scope of my presentation. I will be sticking myself to normal distribution and try to explain different phenomena related to sample size and uh, sample size through this normal distribution. Okay, so so what is a normal distribution? A normal distribution, also known as Gaussian distribution, was uh, described in the 17th century. And he described, when he described it was not called normal distribution, he described it while observing uh, distribution of, uh, while observing errors of in and astronomical measurements. It was later uh, found to be a very good one, good approximate of many, uh, many uh, naturally occurring phenomena and biological values, or in biological values in uh, anthropological uh, measurements and a lot of other measurements, it was found to be very good approximation and that was it was used and it was called normal because it normally occurs in the universe it is widely so widely used because it occurs naturally in many situations and then because it has got a peculiar ability which is called a central limit theorem we'll describe that subsequently it means the samples mean of many non-normal distribution tend to follow it again that as i said there's another beauty of normal distribution that even non-normal distributions if, if you take huge samples for even a binomial distribution can approximate a normal distribution so normal distribution can act as a mother uh, is, is, a, uh, is a mother design on which all the other distributions can be approximated 
So how does it look like? It's like it's like a frequency histogram where you plot the different frequencies uh, of uh, different uh, observations, a different interval of observations, and you get a typical uh, bell sepet curve, uh, bell sepet uh, uh, distribution polygram, so uh, rather histogram, and if you connect the midpoints of all these uh, histograms, you get a curve. And this curve is nothing but the normal curve. What are the uh, specific characteristics of a normal curve? It is bell sepet. It is symmetrical about the mean. The area under curve from minus infinity to the plus infinity is 1. And it can be described by using only two parameters, that the mu, that is the mean, and the standard deviation, that's sigma. And for a normal curve, the mean, median are the same. Now, and this is the mean and this is the standard deviation. Sorry. Not moving. OK. Now, there's something called standard normal distribution. That is a normal distribution where the mean is equal to 0 and the standard deviation is equal to 1, we call this a standard normal distribution. And the characteristic is that the probability of occurrence of the attribute or variable between minus 1 to plus 1 uh, sigma or a standard deviation is around 0.68. That 68% of all values will lie between minus 1 to plus 1 of from mean. 95% of all the all the observations of this distribution, if they follow this distribution, will fall between minus 1.96 to plus 1.96 of the, uh, about the mean, and minus 2.5 uh, uh, standard deviation to plus 2 2.5 standard deviation will have nearly 99% observations. And we said six sigma in the common parlance because we know that by three standard deviation, nearly hundred percent, nearly hundred percent of all observation will fall. So anything that is beyond six six sigma is an outlier. Now, how do you uh, get a standard normal uh, distribution from a normal distribution? It's a simple procedure. You calculate the mean and the standard deviation. You set the mean value as zero. You subtract the mean value from each observations and measure each observation in terms of number of SD below or above the mean. Okay. So suppose and this is the mean value zero and these are the standard deviations one, two, three on the on the both sides. And suppose you have got a standard deviation, uh, sorry, a normal distribution with the mean 10 and standard deviation of two, then what will be the normal deviate? That is normal deviate z value of an observation 13. So we get that z is equal to x minus mu by sigma, which will be 1.5. So it will lie somewhere here. Now, why is uh, this needed? Because we'll be testing our this normal curve uh, and testing our hypothesis using normal curve using a z statistic. Z statistics is nothing. It's it's it tells you how far a particular observation is away from the mean in terms of standard deviation. Okay, please keep this in mind because it's, it, this concept will be needed in understanding the further uh, uh, down the presentations. Now, how is normal distribution and central li limit theorem linked? Now we said that central limit is a, is, is a beauty of normal distribution that it follows central uh, limit theorem. And the beauty is that that if you take sample means of non-normal distribution, they tend to follow the normal distribution as the sample size increases. What is that? I know it is confusing. I will try to make it easier for you. Suppose there is an attribute or a variable which has which is distributed like this. It doesn't follow any known uh, distribution pattern, and it is haphazardly distribution where this is the probability function and this is the uh, values of the attribute, and it has a mean value and it has stand it has a standard deviation sigma mean of mu now suppose from this uh, from this 
population, you take samples of a fixed sample size and you take samples many times, say 100 times, 1000 times, 10,000 times. And you get mean from each or for each of these samples. Now, if you plot that, those means, you will get something which is a normal distribution. So the means of any vague or haphazard or abstract distribution, if you plot them for an infinite or a very large number of times, they will follow the means of those uh, samples will follow a standard, uh, uh, follow a normal distribution with a mean that is equal to the mean of the population. However, the standard deviation will be different. Now, if, if you uh, repeat the experiment with the sample size of 100, We'll get a similar normal curve. However, here the standard deviation of this sampling means we call this a sampling distribution of the sample mean because it is the sample means we are taking and they are distribution. So we call it sampling distribution of the sample mean. The standard deviation of such a sampling distribution will be more stricter, or rather, there will be lesser as we increase the number of samples, uh, sample size, sample uh, number of. Uh, uh, um, number of patient in each sample that is the sample size if we further increase the sample size say 500 the normal curve becomes the well shape is retained but it becomes more steeper and the standard deviation decreases sample standard deviation of the sample means decreases this standard deviation of the sample mean of a sample distribution is called is nothing but the standard error and this is denoted as population standard that it is found by calculated by population standard deviation that is sigma here divided by root over sample size i want you to remember this concept so that we can we will use it uh, further for calculating sam uh, sample size formulas okay. how is null hypothesis and normal curve related well they are not related, but I will try to explain null hypothesis with the help of a normal curve, which will make you easier for you to understand. We know the distribution of sample mean or uh, sample mean in the hypo. If the null hypothesis is true, then we know the uh, possible distribution, all possible outcomes. Okay, so it will follow a standard uh, normal curve, and the, the, since the sample has been uh, taken from the population and uh, sampling distribution mean will be close to the population mean, we expect that any sample we take from that population, their mean will be most of the time close to the close to the original population mean. And if that occurs, we say, H0, the possibility of nihil hypothesis, uh, uh, accepting nihil hypothesis is very high. Okay, I will uh, state in a different way. We assume that null hypothesis is true. That means the sample we have taken from the population represents the sample. So if it's, if we if it, if you take if you take the data or, or you uh, take the mean of a particular attribute, say age of the sample, most of the times that age should be close to the population age that is population uh, age that is uh, the original mean few or a very low probability that they will be very far away from the uh, they will be very far away from the population mean let's say we are uh, we have taken we want to know what is the we rather we want to know what is the age incidence of uh, age of incidence of breast cancer in our hospital and whether that is different from the uh, mean age of uh, incidence in the country okay so we have taken the sample from our hospitals and if if there is no other factor and this sample of our uh, breast cancer patients from our hospital represents uh, is taken from the uh, population and represents that then most of the time our mean say our mean comes to 49 is will be close to say 50 which is the, the mean age in age of incidence of breast cancer in the country 
but it might happen that we have taken the sample or the uh, the patients who came to us had some other thing or somehow they due to some other factors we get we got some uh, data which is mean which is very far from the so suppose we get an uh, mean which is say uh, 39 okay due to some uh, uh, heterogeneous uh, population so that the probability of such occurring that is the mean of our sample 39 and the mean uh, of the population 50 is very low so so when how will you know that actually there is a difference or it is just by chance we don't we cannot for sure tell this that this is by chance or this is due to some specific difference some attribute where only young patients are seen young patients are coming to our hospital or in the in the population we cater young people are getting breast cancer or people are getting breast cancer in an earlier age it could be a possibility but we don't know so what we do is that we we set limits we set limits we said that these these uh, blue lines are the critical value any value that is uh, beyond this critical value we won't accept the null hypothesis we said the no no this this sample then represents another population or it 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 it, it represents something else not the population we are talking about but if it falls within this two blue line then it it falls in the zone of acceptance and we say okay we accept the null hypothesis there is no different or rather the there is uh, the mean sample mean is same as the population mean these critical values are nothing but the significance level and the space between these two blue lines are nothing but the confidence inter interval now we have gathered the concept of confidence inter interval we have gathered con uh, concept of what is a p value or critical value we have gathered the in, uh, con concept of normal curve how normal curve helps in defining different populations or uh, different uh, population di uh, or different population attribute of the, uh, different uh, probability distribution now we'll how this helps in testing and hypothesis for inferential statistics that means for analytical and observational statistic uh, studies we use the statistics to prove or to come to a conclusion so how do we like we have already said we use deductive uh, method that is state and hypothesis we collect data and you find that find and we test uh, we uh, calculate the calculate the population attribute in the sample and based on that it form perform a test and find out uh, whether it fall, falls on the zone of acceptance and we reject or accept the hypothesis and then we generalize so suppose this is the population we take a sample from that and in that sample we test the hypothesis we come to a conclusion based on the sample and then we generalize that to the population this is how do uh, how we do a statistical inference so here we can see that hypothesis testing is a key point So what is hypothesis testing it is deducing the consequence that should be observable if the hypothesis is correct also helps us to select the research methods that will permit observation experimentation or other procedures necessary to show whether or this do or do not occur applying these methods and gathering the data that can be analyzed to indicate whether the hypothesis can be supported or we can reject or accept the hypothesis so basically it is it is an a surrogate of testing the whole population we are testing it in a small sample that we are generalizing on that population what are the steps involved in uh, hypothesis testing defining the hypothesis very clearly finding the representing sample or rather taking the representative sample collecting the relevant data the variable or the variable uh, attribute we want to uh, test in that sample and collecting that uh, from each individual in the sample to see the appropriate test statistics depending on the probability distribution 
if it is a continuous variable and if it's a big sample you can take a z test if it's a small sample you can take t test if it's a categorical data you can take the chi square uh, probability distribution if it's a dichromatous data you can take use a bi binomial distribution and so on and so on um, and then you calculate the value of the test that is specific to the hypothesis now hypothesis and depending on the value you calculate the probability and what is the probability of the mean or the um, sample attribute as compared to the population attribute and to get the p-value you reject or accept the hypothesis now while doing so since we are not taking the whole population there are chances that we will make an error since a sample is a small representation is a small part of the whole population we are bound to take the error so we take away two types of error a type one error what is that a type one error is when h0 is false and uh, sorry h0 is true and h a is false means the sample represents the population or rather the test and the control arm are same but and in this situation if we accept the h0 based on the sample we have taken then we have done the right thing but somehow because some error or due to the small sample size though the sample represents the population or there is no difference with the test arm or the controller we have rejected the hypothesis rejected the null hypothesis we have made an error this type of error is called a type one error test of significance a level of significance is nothing but the measure of how how much type one error we want we are going to accept okay see again see here there can be some uh, samples whose mean will lie here in this zone of rejection that doesn't mean they're not from the uh, population but since we ne need to bind it to some value we put this alpha level of significance so any value which is from the sample but that falls in this beyond this critical zone of it is on zone we will not accept the null hypothesis but then we will be committing an error that is the type one error what about type two error a type two error is when a zero is false and ha true that means in reality the sample does not re represent the population or there's a difference in treatment arm and the control arm we accept the h zero that means we accept the null hypothesis somehow due to small sample we did not get enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis we make an error we have if you reject the null hypothesis we have done the right thing but if you don't we have made an error this type of mistake is called a type 2 error so if we uh, plot this in the two by two table and we measure all the possible outcomes of null hypothesis we have condition like unknown true situation which we don't know in reality sorry in reality we don't know the true situation whether that is a0 is true or a0 false that is there is no effect there is effect and we do the uh, test on a sample and based on that we accept the null hypothesis or reject the null hypothesis so in two situations where a0 is true and we accept we take the correct decision and a0 is false and we reject the a0 we have taken the correct decision. but if a0 is true in reality and we reject it we do a type one error and is is false and we accept an a0 we do a type two error here this should be very clear type one and type two error what is the relation between hypothesis testing and confidence interval a0 is rejected with the two side level of alpha test if and only if the two sided 100 percent into one minus alpha confidence interval for for the mean does not contain mu zero that is the sample mean similarly a zero is accepted the two sided level of alpha test if and only the two sided 100 percent into one minus alpha confidence contains the mu zero okay so this is depicted like if x x is within the confidence interval then we accept it if it is beyond we reject it sample let's assume that the population is either norm, is normally distributed with a mean of 50 say that is age of mean age of incidence of uh, breast cancer 
and the standard deviation of 10 or our uh, hospitals actually represent a different type of uh, population because we are seeing uh, an older age of incidence of breast cancer and it is normally distributed by a mean of 55 and a standard deviation of 10. So there are two situations. So for H0, mu is equal to 10 and sigma, that is standard deviation is equal, I'm sorry, mu is equal to 50 and standard deviation is equal to 10. For alternative hypothesis, mu is equal to 55 and sigma is equal to 10. Now we take a sample of 25 from this population and cal calculate the mean x of this random variable. That is the mean age of age of incidence of breast cancer. So we have this uh, two sampling distribution. This is 50. This is 55. And two possible zeros. This is a scenario where we uh, a zero is true. That means the power of uh, our our sample represent the population mean that is the 50 is the mean age of incidence and this is the distribution or our sample or our hospital sample represents a, a different population where the mean age is 55 and this is the distri uh, probability distribution and this supports the alternative hypothesis and our value lies somewhere in between so for example sample 25 we will calculate x and if a0 is true then x is distributed as n, like the first curve. And if ha is true, x is distributed as n, mu is equal to 55, and the second curve. So there are three zones in these two overlapping curves, normal curves of sampling distribution. Zone A, any sample mean in this region, suppose our sample, our sample uh, mean false say this mean is 50 it is 49 then obviously a0 is true similarly if it falls in the c zone that is if it is 56 obviously the alternate hypothesis is true that is our the our population sample is different represents a different population that where the age of incidence of breast cancer is older much take present is a much old, older age but if our sample mean falls somewhere in between in the red zone the b zone then either of the hypothesis could be true it could be nine hypothesis could be true or the alternative hypothesis would be true and we need to find out sorry suppose now we test S0 by generating a sample based of 25, what we have done already with the probability of rejecting uh, or rather a significance level of 0 0.5 and uh, of rejecting type 1 error. So, and it is, since it is one-sided test, X will be the cutoff point for accepting, accepting null happy. Since it is one-sided test, we will take this the z value of this is 1.645. Had it been two sided, then it had been 1.96. But since it's one sided test, one tail test, it is 1.645. Will be equal to x minus 50 by the standard error. How you get the standard error? We div uh, divide, divide the st population standard deviation 10 by the sample uh, root over of the sample size that is 5. So get it to you 2. So x is equal to 1.645 into 2 plus 50, that's 53.25, which means that any value greater than 53.29 will reject the null hypothesis. We'll say that our this sample, the, uh, the hospital sample, does not represent the null hypothesis and it has a different population. What if HA was true? Alternative hypothesis, and in reality, which we don't know, actually, the population we are seeing is a genetic population. Here, the age of incidence is slightly more, and 55 is actual mean, and not the pop man, the whole country mean of 50, which is which should be considered. Then, the sampling distribution will follow HA and not H0. So, any value below 53.29 will be supp viewing support as supporting H0. Here, yeah. but then any any value say 52 will be viewed as supporting a zero. But in actuality, it is the alternative h a which is true. 
But since A0 is not true, any value below 53.29 will lead to type 2 error. So the probability of X being less than 53.29, sorry, is equal to probability of Z less than 53.2155 by the standard error. That is Z uh, of minus 175.2, forget the calculation. So a probability of minus, a probability of say, minus this is the this is the this is the distance minus 8.855 that means 0.8 standard deviation from the ha which corresponds to 19 percent this this uh, correspond this this uh, uh, area under the calm corresponds to 19 percent 0.193 so in this scenario if we take a0 as the true we make a type on error sorry if we a0 in reality is true we make a type on error for 53.29 value in 5% of time but if ha is true we make a type 2 error in almost 20% of time and the power that is the ability to correctly identify the alternative hypothesis will be 1 minus beta that is will be around 80 percent clear so this concept has to be clear so again anything if a0 is true and anything within beyond this line is correct decision if ha is true anything beyond this line correct decision is a0 is false and a value is here, we accept A0, we do a type 2 error. If A0 is true, anything falls here and we reject it, it we make a type 1 error. So there comes the concept of power. Power is nothing but the proportion of area under the alternative hypothesis, hypothesis curve that is in the rejection region. So is the region in the rejection area but when alternative hypothesis is the truth so you can well assume from this curve we can see that if we increase the if you, if you shift this line that is with uh, decrease the alpha level the power increases and if we if you shift this line that is the critical level to more toward the right the power decreases the alpha increases sorry alpha reduces so there are three zones this zone it represents the alpha error this green uh, zone uh, shown by the green arrow is the beta error and this area shown by the red arrow is the power of the study so what are the factors that affect power again from this diagram we can see how can you reduce the power uh, sorry increase the power simply by making this curves steeper so if you make this curve steeper the normal value steeper uh, normal curve steeper then for the same alpha, you will have better, more power. And how can you do that? You increase the sample size. How? If you increase the sample size, the denominator in the standard error increases. Denominator, that is square root of n, increases. So, And we have seen from the central limit theorem, the curves will become steeper. So for the same alpha level, the power will increase. Second, if we decrease the significance level if you make it 0.001 this uh, bar will shift this way more towards the right and the power power will decrease and if we make it to 0.01 the power will increase degree of variability of observation we know the standard error is dependent on the population mean by the root over root over n the sample size now what is population mean population mean is the variability of the population or it is an indicator of the homogeneity or rather heterogeneity of the population so if you take samples from a very homogeneous population we decrease this sigma and if you decrease the sigma the standard error 
decreases, our calf gets stiffer and we increase the power. And finally, power increases, which increase the effect of interest. Just see, we have taken it as 50, suppose in the earlier example, 50 and it is 55. Say our population the, for the alternative hypothesis had a mean value of 60. Then the car should have separated. So for the same level of alpha, the power would have increased. So this is called the effect size, or rather, for the effect we expect, or the difference in effect, we, uh, difference in uh, the value of mean between the alternative hypothesis and the null hypothesis, or rather, in simple terms, the difference in value between the test term and the mean value between the test and the control. The more the difference, the more is the effect size. I will give an example. Say. Which will be more? Which uh, will need more power? You have a uh, uh, say. Some response to um, radiation in a uh, in a in a particular tumor is say ten percent, and you increase by giving adding chemotherapy. You may you expect to increase it by five percent. In another scenario, you see lymphoma, the, or rather a uh, squamous cell carcinoma. The, Baseline uh, response to radiation is 50%, and you add cetuximab, you expect it to be 70%. So here the effect size is 5%, here the 10%. Obviously, uh, smaller samples will be needed, sample size will be needed, or rather, a more power uh, for the same cell, more power, uh, the study will have more power if you consider the second one than the first one, because this is a very small effect of interest. The smaller the effect of interest, the more sample size is needed, and for the given sample size, the lesser power it, it has. Okay, now we have cast all the uh, concepts of alpha power, alpha error, beta error, null hypothesis. We'll go to the sample size calculation. I can take a break of five minutes, and if uh, the chairpersons allow, I can take one, two questions, or I can straight away go to the uh, sample size calculation part. Hello. Hmm. Shuranjan, are you there? Yes. Uh, is there any question? No. Till now, only one question is there. Uh, so the problem is, uh, total time we have, uh, we are we are stipulated time to be taken up to seven forty-five p.m. and it's only about. Uh, oh, oh, then 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 I will I will I will hurry up. Yeah, yeah. Hurry. Only the I, I think okay, only okay. the ten so, twenty. Okay. So. I will go to say to sample size calculation. Now, why do you need to calculate the sample size? Because we need an adequate sample size. Why adequate sample size matters? Because if you take smaller sample size, we will get erroneous results. We have seen that because of alpha error, beta error will increase and we'll get erroneous results. And also the power will be inadequate. So all the effort, the money, everything we have given into the research will be a futile. And it is unethical also. You make a you do a study which has inadequate power, doesn't add to the uh, literature or change the uh, standard of care, then it is unethical. Similarly, if you take a big sample, it is problematic. Why? If you take a big sample, it is unnecessarily expensive. If you can get the same power with a smaller sample, why do you need to get a bigger sample? Second, it is time consuming. Suppose you want to recruit, uh, say, 1,000 patients for GBM. So you may have, may have to accrue for, say, six years, seven years. And by the time you finish the accrual and the follow-up and uh, publish the result, 10 years has gone. So the treatment which we will start standard at that time might change. So the study becomes redundant. And it is unethical also. Suppose you get a new treatment for GBM and it, it can be tested using 200 samples, use weighted for 1000 samples. So the extra 800 patients, those who randomized in the non treatment are, are basically depriving of the superior treatment. So that is unethical. So we need an adequate sample size, not too much, too more than that, not too less than that. So how do we calculate the sample size from our RLP? get an idea, the sample size is directly proportional to the error component. The more error we are 
willing to accept the smaller sample size or rather the less error we are willing to accept the bigger sample size it is also related to the variance or the population variable and finally it is inversely propor uh, proportional to the effect size or precision effect size if you are doing a comparative study precision which means the margin of error it is not the same as the risk of error it is the margin of error we are willing to accept okay uh, and, and that is for our single sample size so by simply we write sample size is equal to problem okay sample size is equal to error component into various or proportion component divided by the effect size or precision component this is the basic formula for sample size for any sample size calculation this is the basic formula so what is an effect size effect size is what i have already dis uh, discussed it is denoted by delta it represent the estimated magnitude of difference between the group of critical in importance because small delta leads to larger sample size and a large delta to smaller sample size it actually determines the fine balance between clinical and statistical significance so suppose we have taken a huge sample size and taken a small delta a survival of say 15 days well it is statistical significant but might not be clinical relevant you get a p value of 0 0.001 but it's not relevant 15 days huge expensive treatment it's not worth it similarly we have a very good treatment but we have from before time we have kept an effect size of 40 percent too optimistic but due to the inadequate sample whatever the effect came came to be 25 percent sample size was calculated with 40 percent of uh, uh, effect size and because the result came was 25 percent it was not statistically significant but any day for an oncological trial a 25 25 percent difference in response rate is widely clinically meaningful and acceptable to the clinician so this is a pictorial uh, way of understanding effect site as you remove the curves more the effect size increases and as the effect size increases your sample size decreases the need for sample size adequate sample size decreases what about precision precision is a measure is how close estimate how close an estimate is to the true value means if it's for a single sample it's not for two samples then mean if you the sample how close is the sample uh, parameter close to the population better means the sample mean to the population mean it's an it's a margin of error we generally accept uh, we, we don't ex expect to be uh, the sample mean to be 100 percent to the uh, equal to the uh, population mean we give it an uh, error or rather a margin that is a precision sorry now there is another concept called design effect a design effect it's more for the epidemiological study single sample sorry surveys where if you do something apart from a simple random sampling wherein the subjects are not and the samples are non independent to each other it means you don't take individuals as units rather you need you take bunch of individuals as unit then you have to increase the sample size to a particular uh, number that number is nothing but the design e effect it's only one for a simple random sampling or it's more than one it may be two for some cluster immunization samples or cluster sampling i'm not dwelling into this thing because in our um, studies uh, on oncological studies or studies that uh, the postgraduates will be doing design effect doesn't come often so we don't do sampling uh, uh, epidemiological sampling survey type of studies we do generally uh, cross-sectional study prospective or restructural single arm studies or comparative studies so i have not dwelt into deep uh, into this concept of design effect the required sample is just uh, adjusted for the design effect what are the sample set calculation for non cooperative studies suppose you as a postgraduate want to do a retrospective study and to and find out what is the same um, average response to uh, radiotherapy in your in your uh, uh, csr dix cases in your uh, in your hospital and you want to do a study so what sample you will be needing or you want to do a, a prospective cohort you do a new fractionation a different type of hyperfractional schedule you want to find out what is the response rate and and you want to do the study what to do with the sample size similarly at some point of time you want to find out those who have got um, a particular treatment 
five uh, five few uh, say fall fox versus those are those who have got uh, uh, capox is there any difference in toxicity and you get a cross sectional one time snapshot survey so what type of uh, sample size do we need for such studies so first we have to determine what is the outcome linear but that is the, what is we, we are seeing is it a continuous variable that is are we measuring mean uh, value in psa or something like that the mean age of incidence or we are valuing the, uh, seeing the response rates failure versus non failure or survival or uh, versus no survival so depending on that our sample size formula changes and again the concept of standard normal standard normal distribution comes and we know these are the limits and if our x falls uh, in, within the whether within the acceptance zones or the rejection zones as per the confidence in, in interval we have already defined now we know from the uh, central limit theorem that this set z that is how far the x is from the mu can be expressed as mu minus x by sigma x that is the standard deviation of this sampling distribution i hope you remember what is sampling distribution it is no nothing but mu minus x by standard error now if we if we compute that we say z is equal to mu minus x plus small interaction yeah. to dr ranish uh, already we have crossed the limitation what? time will you please concise okay okay i will i will do it okay so from that we can we we can do the calculations and find the value of mean which is nothing there and we come to this formula z n is equal to z into sigma whole square by a mu minus x whole square this is this mu minus x is nothing but the precision so desired sample size the already we have discussed that we get the same formula z that is the error component into variance component divided by precision suppose it is the outcome was a dichotomous variable then again uh, like response rate to radiotherapy and concurrent carboplatin so here the variance is, uh, variance is uh, measured as p into 1 minus p so the formula would be z square into p into 1 minus p divided by d square d square is nothing but the fx size that is the difference between the test term the uh, expected proportion between the test and the sorry and the uh, control arm so here's an example where i have uh, calculated uh, the sample size for a uh, desired sample size for a proportion got a proportion and not to be 380 hey 45 sorry i've mentioned 45 percent uh, is the uh, expected proportion we found out for a sim single sample the expected sample size will be 380 now what about it, it is a if it is a comparative study two sample calculations okay basic considerations are same study design whether it is a parallel or crossover crossover uh, designs have an intensive sample what type of hypothesis single one tail or two tailed what is the primary endpoint dichromatous or continuous expected response test versus control meaningful difference and these are already there level of sickness and power add, to add to it there are the dropout rate correction for dropout rate and correction for unequal treatment allocation suppose there is a active control randomized control trial to see the effectiveness of pain uh, in, and effectiveness of new schedule in reducing pain and we get to we, we say that we will accept it if it reduces the pain score by 5% from baseline with a standard deviation of 1.195 and uh, we try to find out uh, and we consider drop it out 10% we try to calculate the sample size that is z alpha by 2 by z beta here we have taken the beta also which is 80% and we calculate the sample size it comes to around 90 patient per arm now because there is a dropout consideration of 10% we add 10 to each 10% to each of them so total sample size comes us to be 200 now in this case we assume that the standard deviation in both samples will be same but in cases where standard deviations are different in different sample we have to um, take in account of that 
So the sample uh, size calculus is similarly. If you take unequal sample size, that one sample size is one that the, the unequal number of pa uh, patients in the control and the test term, we have to take uh, make uh, adjustment for the same, and these are the formulas for the same. The impact of unequal science is very great. If you if you can see from this table for the same samples uh, same power 100 samples i for 500 and 500 in each arm when we change it to 25 to 75 the power decreases but if to keep this power to 0.88 we have to increase the sample size to more than 5000 from 100 to 5000 so it, always one should keep try to keep the ratio one is to one because that gives you the least sample size about comparing proportions similar formula to what we have said for single sample except that here because we are comparing two proportions the, there will be two proportions the p1 and the p2 p, test and the control and we the sample size is changed accordingly and we use the uh, z beta that type 2 error is an example We uh, the test arm response rate was fifty percent. Uh, sorry, the control was fifty percent, and the test arm was expected to uh, to be increased by fifteen percent with a clinical mini meaningful uh, difference. Uh, and uh, the ninety five percent confidence of alpha and power of uh, eighty percent beta. So we get a sample size of around one sixty six patients per group. So we will get two for two groups. We will get two thirty three thirty two patients. Now, we'll, I've taken this example to show that how this formula, which we have shown, uh, fits for randomized control trials with, that we know of, the landmark trial. This is the 911 trial, organ preservation, where they have taken the hypo, they want to say, see the response rate, language to me free survival rate between chemotherapy and radiotherapy, radiotherapy alone and concurrent chemo radiation. They have expected that the concurrent chemo radiation arm would the survival rate will be 65% and there will be a 15% increase with a type 1, type 2 error of 0.5 and 80%. Okay, so here the P1 is 0 0.65, P2 is 0 0.5, P1 minus P2 is 0 0.15, the power is 80%, that is 0 0.8, bed beta is equal to 0 0.84. Hello, Anisa. Hello. Anisa, are you there? Mm. I think there is a network problem. Uh, I think there is not a problem. Let's wait for three, four minutes. Okay. Maximum, how much time can we? Sir, we can max. Sir, we can maximally uh, uh, admit up to eight pm. My clock it is already seven fifty four. Yes, sir. Then it's only six minutes left. Yeah, we have only five minutes in hand. On is the. Hello, Nisda. Hello. Hello, Anish. Is it audible to you? Because it is suddenly stopped your lecture. Anisa, could you hear us? Kostov, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. 
we can hear you yes uh, please share hear. carry on is the share your screen hello yes. yeah share yes. your screen kostop yeah yeah we can hear you can you hear me yeah hello yeah we can hear you hello anish amra sunte pacchi tumi chaliye jao hello hello yes anish Hello. Yes, Anish, da we can hear you. Hello. Anish, da we can hear you. It's okay. loud and clear. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, some technical fault. So, will I continue the presentation? Yeah, yeah. Please share your screen. So, can can you see? Uh, can you see this? Can you see my screen? No, it's not visible till now. Now. Is it visible? Uh. No, yeah. the whole screen actually is visible, not the presentation. Presentation is not. No, no. still not. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, just rotate it. Okay. Yes. Sorry, sorry for the. There is some problem. I don't know why it's happening. we have we have done this sorry yeah yeah so we have come to we are, we are discussing the 911 uh, trial and we are, we are calculating the sample size for that okay once So this was the study. P is uh, in that intervention arm is 0.65. P in the test arm is 0.5. The uh, expected increase is 0.15, 0.15. That is 15 percent, and it is the power and the alpha. We put this in the formula we have already discussed, and we found we find that the sample size is 166 per arm. Now we increase it for 10 percent, which was already described in this trial. That is 182 patients per arm. And for three arms, we get a sample size of 546. Now, if you go back, you see this is the exact number of samples. This was the exact sample size they have targeted. So this uh, formula fits. Now, this was an old trial. Recent you know, sample size trials, they use a lot of modification. And so not all of the trials you will see the sample size would fit with this formula. But whatever it is, whatever formula, the complicated formula they use, the difference in sample the size will be not more than 10 percent. You must remember one solid formula which, which you can follow. There are numerous formulas, numerous assumptions, numerous modifications. Do not remember, you do not need to remember everything. Now, I will quickly go to the sample size calculation of randomized control trial. Randomized control trial also can be, uh, sample size can also be calculated the way we have calculated, but there are so there are three types of randomized trials and, and the hypothesis actually changes with the type of some uh, randomized control trial. So we have this superiority trial versus inferiority trial versus equivalence trial. Superiority trials, the hypothesis should be that H1 is more than H1. But generally, we follow H not H1 not is equal to H0. And this is why, because suppose we do at one tell test and you find a negative uh, result, the interpretation will be that there is in, insufficient evidence to conclude the new treatment is better than the standard. So we have to do another test to find out whether it is inferior to the standard treatment. So this is waste of uh, its resources. That's why people don't 
though it wants to take h1 more than h0 that is h1 alternative hypothesis mean is more than the uh, null hypothesis but that is not generally followed what is followed is h1 is not equal to h0 okay and we cannot conclude that new intervention is similar or inferior to the standard if there is insufficient evidence and we know that a two sided hypothesis results in a larger sample size so superiority as if it's two sided hypothesis has a larger sample size what about a non infield trial a non infield trial has a different sample size calculation in the sense it in it puts into or introduces a something called non infinity margin and the hypothesis is that h minus a0 must be more than equal to non infinity margin and for sample size calculation the delta must be less than non infinity margin because non infinity trials use small deltas they have often have large samples what about the equivalence trial equivalence trial also introduces a margin but here the margin is called equivalence margin and it is taken in the both sides and the hypothesis is a0 minus that non hypothesis minus alternative hypothesis is more than equal to equivalent margin or less than equal to margin if it is within the uh, mar uh, equivalent margin then a0 is accepted that is there is no difference so we if you pictorially represent this see suppose is the uh, line of equivalence there is no effect and this on the right side the controls are superior and the left side the inferior uh, intervention is superior for a superiority trial its mean and the uh, confidence lies below the delta minus delta it is a superiority established even if it is within the delta margin superiority is established but anything any any uh, any mean whose confidence interval cuts the line of equivalence superiority is not established for a non infinite trial if the mean lies within the non infinite margin but the confidence interval the upper limit of the confidence interval cuts the um, equivalence line that non infinite is not established similarly even if the mean lies in the within the non infinite margin but the confidence in interval is below the um, confidence interval it uh, cuts the lower margin of the non infinite mar uh, uh, lower margin of the non infinite then non infinite is not established however a study whose mean and the confidence lies within the uh, within the uh, no equivalence line and the non infinite margin the non infinity is established similarly for a equivalence trial any a a a any study which whose confidence interval cuts the non infinity margin uh, sorry the equivalence margin is a negative trial similarly if it uh, does the equivalence uh, line on the positive side again the equivalence is not established but if it is line lies within the two uh, margins positive and negative equivalence uh, margin then it is a positive trial so we have to change our sample size accordingly and the sample size takes is a different from what sample size we have already calculated for a comparative trial here in we actually take into account the delta zero or the margin which we we want to take and here p we always take the control probability pro probability or other proportion or the response rate or the proportion in the control arm we don't take in the we take into account the experimental arm drop out we have already discussed we have to calculate the uh, sample size and made an adjustment for the drop out and the formula is the new in new sample size is, is equal to in by 1 minus d where d, d is the percentage of drop out so here yeah, you have to increase the for a 10 percent drop out we have to increase to 111 percent sample size suppose the sample size is taken from a population which is not fine uh, in finite but a finite suppose you want to take a sample size of about 200 patients so you have to modify because if, if the whole sample size might be uh, more than the population so there are various formulas for that the cochrane formula and the yaman formula the cochrane formula actually proposes a correction wherein the population in, uh, size is taken into account so if the original sample size is 100 and population uh, size is 1000 the corrected sample size will be around 91 so there will be some reduction in the sample size 
Similarly, there is this ML formula which also uses a similar formula where, however, it uses E, which E is the precision. Now, if, see what is the effect of this formula on population, on population, on the sample size, depending on the population. For a population that is large, like thousand, and a precision, uh, when and a population for 450, we see that there is one third reduction in the sample size for a precision of five percent. But for a precision of 10% it is much lesser. So for a thousand original population, a sample size with 5% uh, confidence interval, 5% uh, uh, precision, it would be 278, whereas it will be 208 for a 450 uh, si uh, population size of 450. There are various uh, software, uh, this, uh, all these calculations are very uh, tiring and it is difficult to remember. So there are various uh, softwares available the most uh, robust is one of, one of the most robust is the g power which calculates this complex test f test i squares test then you can also get the graph there's ps power and sample size calculus uh, calculation which we gave from vanderbilt university which is also good it also can uh, perform a complex uh, solutions there is this inquiry advisor it is a commercial software which is not free and there is this clinical uh, sample size calculator which is free and it is very handy very easy to use so g power looks like this where you give the where you give the what type of tail uh, test you want to do what is the critical alpha value what is the uh, beta value what is the power and then you you give the uh, proportion alpha beta ratio and it calculates the alpha and beta and you give so the sample size but a much simpler version is a clinical calculator, which is uh, widely available in the web. Here, it, it has a very good user-friendly interface. You can design, study, and you can find out whether you are taking one sample or two sample, whether you use the variable is very simple. Variable is continuous or dichotomous. You give the, you give the anticipated proportion in the test term, in the control term, and then you give the alpha and the beta error and then just calculate and here we have calculated 462. This is I think is the most user-friendly um, calculator which can be used by all residents and if they want to calculate it with the help of the computer and not manually. So to sum up for random for uh, comparative studies and randomized control trials, what are the things that affect the sample size? The type of endpoint, whether it is categorical or numerical, whether the study design is single or two ohm, whether you have a superiority non inferiority or equivalent design, Equivalent and non-entry trials have a larger sample size. Whether what is the power, uh, what is the dropout rate, what is the length of follow-up and accrual period. The longer the period, uh, uh, follow-up period, the smaller the sample size. We have very complex calculation for this. I have not deliberately not included in this uh, presentation. And finally, the measure of dispersion. The more the dispersed, the more sample size. The more uh, homogeneous a population, the lesser sample size is needed. Finally, to sum up, clinical research is fundamental in advancing medical care of patients. I mean, all methodological factors that needs to be considered, sample size is provided the most critical because a lot of things depends on it. A proper planning of sample, sorry, proper planning of sample size calculus into time and consideration of various statistical parameters. But before that, you need to know what you are. The concepts, what is null hypothesis, what are the errors, what is power, because even for the software, you, to run the software, you have to con have the concepts clear. They're ready to available free online. And but for you, for the post graduate, the basic sample size would be trusted and you can use it like, uh, for, for your thesis and all the small studies you are going to do. But if you are doing a uh, 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 a trial, a trial, a sponsored trial, or a, a academic trial, it is always better to have an experienced statistician on board because otherwise there will be legal implications and it is easier to get a sponsor or ethical clearance if you have a statistician on board. So this ends my presentation. Sorry for being uh, overshooting the time. There was some technical issues, but I hope you have got an idea of how sample size is calculated and what are the basic concepts behind uh, the formula of the sample size calculation.
Thank you, Anish, for your excellent presentation. I know that there was some hurry due to the uh, time shortage in your last you. few slides. Yes, sir. Is it audible? I'm audible. Yes, sir. I don't know how to. But I think you have some of a very difficult subject in a very lucid and very interesting way. And if possible, I it's my suggestion to all the postgraduate students uh, that if they repeatedly listen this uh, lecture to their by from their recording group, and after repeated revision of this lecture. Uh, then many of the things will be cleared from their uh, for their concept yes, yes, and that yes, is very yes, much yes, important yes, also yes, for uh, a better presentation for publication in their future life. Uh, the only bad thing or that the uh, disheartening thing that uh, today we have started with 80 participants and at the end of the session I see there is only 51 participants. So number of dropout is around 29. I think that's not a good sign for us. However, it is probably the last weekend before Durga Puja. That may be the uh, cause of the um, So I think if this lecture of Dr. Anish Banerjee uh, be recorded and be distributed among all of us, then that will be helpful for us. With this, I end. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the kind words. I hope it has been useful for the residents. Over to you, Mr. Kostov. If there are uh, any questions, um, I will. I can answer them now, or I can answer them later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Onisda. This is Suranjan. Thank you, Onisda. Thank you, Professor Alok Ghosasiya, sir. So, we are going to wind up today because it's a shortage of time, first of all. And secondly, there are two, three questions there. We are keeping, keep on, keep, we will keep that for the next session. We'll address these questions on the next, next session prior 15 minutes before the starting of the exact session on that day. And this is uh, there will be no uh, such uh, such session on the next Saturday because we will have the pujas, and the next session will be on the 31st of the October. Till then, goodbye all. And uh, for the residents, uh, it's to be announced that uh, we will be we will be making the MCQ at the self-assessment test for today. We'll be shooting the we'll be shoot the mail tonight only. And you are, ad you are advised to uh, feedback over that by the next week. And by the next week of the, on the Friday, that will be maximum. That will be the last date for the uh, for submission of that paper. And with that, we conclude today. And happy pujas to all. We'll see you on the next webinar on 31st of October. Thank you. Thank you very much.